right, welcome. Happy Monday, happy start of week two. Hope everyone is managing to stay warm today. Please pick up your uh, flicker card from the corner over there. Uh, all right, any questions about the lab, any of the Java stuff that we've been looking at to, uh, to get us started? One thing that I want to mention, because I don't think I've mentioned it before, is that uh, at the bottom of, uh, I'm on the course calendar here, and at the bottom of the notes for each day, so if I look at the, uh, the notes for Friday, which we actually didn't get to, we'll be getting to some of this stuff today, uh, but there are, are practice problems included with the notes for each day, along with solutions to the practice problems, uh, and working on these practice problems is a great way to review and practice the material, uh, make sure that, that uh, you understand what's going on. So I just wanted to make sure to mention those specifically. So speaking of review, let's do one such exercise now. All right, I have four choices here. I'd like you to see if you can identify which is the correct syntax uh, if we want to create an array that holds n integers. We're mostly thinking it's D. Please have a discussion with your neighbor so you can come to an agreement on what the right syntax is. Uh, lots of movement toward D. That's great. This will be the syntax we will use. Can break this down into a few pieces. First, we have the type of what type are variable named A is going to have, and it's going to be, we see the square brackets, so we know it's an array, and then int tells us the things in this array are ints. And then as part of this assignment statement with this equals here, we have some value, some data that we're assigning to our variable A, and that data has to match our type, our array of integers. And so we have new, which we use in Java to create a new object. Anytime we're creating a new object, we're gonna see the new keyword. And then what comes after new is going to be uh, <clears throat> uh, whatever we need uh, to, uh, basically uh, will typically be a calling a method that constructs a particular object. Arrays are special. They have this somewhat different syntax where we have, again, our array type, but with this time, the size of our array inside the brackets, which could be a number. Uh, we could have just written a number here like 10, but it can also be a variable, so long as that variable is in integer so that we have a whole number of, of spots in our array. What are your questions on this? How, do? How come the notion of doing new does not apply to strings since there are objects? Yes, so that's an excellent question. Why can we do this without writing new? So, in this case, instead of constructing a new object in this way, you've identified there's actually another way we can kind of make an object in memory. We 
with what's called a literal value, meaning that uh, we could, for strings, we could write string s equals new string. And this is uh, a pretty standard way we construct new objects in Java. And we'll see exactly what, uh, we'll see more, ex uh, we'll see exactly how this kind of, the name of the object in parentheses, what that is, we'll see uh, very shortly. It is called a constructor, a special function that is part of creating a new new object, setting up all, uh, all of its data. And so this creates a new string, but it's, it's empty. There's not actually any, uh, any characters in that string. Here, we have a literal string value, which Java will put in the computer's memory for us. So we don't have to use new if we have one of these literal values that says, here's exactly the object we want. We can actually do this with arrays. If we use curly braces, and spe we can specify exactly the elements of the array. So this would make a, a new array that has 1, 3, and 10 in it. So here we're seeing the, uh, a pattern that's common to most programming languages that have been around for decades, the way that, that Java has, uh, in that we just have many different ways of doing similar or the same thing. And they all use kind of slightly different syntax. So they, if there's kind of one thing to take away from this, it's this one here, how we have new, and we give the size of our array. What other questions do you have? Sammy. So in a case where you're having an increasing size of an array, so you're running through a program and you're just adding to a list, would something like that still work? Or would you have to do something like that? So this is an excellent question. You're, you're jumping ahead to uh, uh, Wednesday's topic, which is dealing with exactly this question. Uh, we don't always know ahead of time exactly how big we want our array. And maybe we need to actually have it be flexible, have it be able to get bigger as time goes on. But I've told you that arrays are fixed in size. So we're actually going to have to kind of dig into our data structures bag of, of tricks and we'll see a way to basically create a kind of array-like object, but that has this nice property that it's gonna get bigger when we need it to. But the answer is with just these basic kind of arrays that Java provides, once we make them, there's no way to change the size. Other questions? There's one bit, uh, one important bit of Java uh, that uh, I want to uh, go over, and that is uh, last time we saw a while loop. Uh, when we were doing a loop over uh, an array of numbers to, to find the average, and I had done index is zero, and then said while index is less than the length of the array, and then I was doing something uh, with the array, And then I was adding one to index. And so uh, from your, your previous uh, programming, is there another kind of loop other than a while loop that we might expect to find in Java? Ron? 
Yes, a for loop. So in Java, for loops look pretty different than for loops in, uh, or can look very different than for loops in Python. And a for loop, the most common for loop in Java, or basically takes these three parts, initializing our loop variable, the condition, and changing the loop variable, and puts them all on a single line. And it looks like this. We would say for int index equals zero, semicolon, index less than nums dot length, semicolon, index plus plus. And then inside the curly braces, we'd be doing whatever we were doing inside our loop. Last time it was adding up each number in the array. And so this for loop is just doing these steps of initializing our loop variable, our loop condition, and incrementing or changing our loop variable just all kind of slapped together on one line. So the effect of the code in these two cases is the same. We just have a different way to express it as a for loop. Does that make sense? Questions on this? Yeah, Ron. Could you do it like all in separate lines? Like, because with the semicolons, it's kind of kind of implies that you could also just space it out. Uh, you mean just put these all on separate lines? Yeah, like could you in theory do that? But still have it be before. Mm -hmm. Yes. So unlike Python, Java doesn't care about new lines and tabs. They they mean nothing to Java. <laughs> like you could take your Java program and just slap it all on one line, all with a semicolon separating each line of code, and Java would be totally fine with that. Similarly, we could put these on separate lines and it would be equivalent. Java just completely ignores kind of new lines uh, and, and tabs in that way. So this for loop here, as the variable suggests, a loop over indexes. And if I were to write the equivalent thing, In, in Python, it might be something like for index in range of LAN of nums. So if you're thinking about how to take what you know about Python, how to write a for loop that goes through the indexes of some list and translate it into a Java for loop that does the same thing, these are kind of go together. Is there another, can we use a Python for loop to go through, you know, the actual numbers in our list? Yes, no? Yes. Yes. How would we do that? For index n, and then the name of the, name of the um, list you want covers. Yeah, we can do something like for num and nums, and this is a loop I would say this is a loop over the elements, over the numbers in our list, rather than the indexes. Java, we can write a loop over elements. And we would say for int num colon nums. And this is given the name of a for each loop in, in Java. Yeah. It's a colon, not a semicolon. This is a colon. Okay. Yes. Uh, 
may be weird, not all this other Java, there weren't colons anywhere, uh, but then this one there is. Uh, we got here because when Java was first created, it did not have this kind of for each loop. This didn't exist. And this sort of for loop was the only kind there was. And then many versions of Java later, many years later, they decided to add this for each loop and had to come up with, well, okay, what syntax should it use that will make it different from this other for loop? And so this kind has loop variable colon thing we're looping over. All right, let's do a little bit of practice with a for loop. So on the screen here, I'm creating an array of four numbers uh, using that uh, literal value with the curly braces, and then I have a for loop that does something with this array. So I'm asking you to think through what will the four numbers in the array be after this code runs. All right. N not thinking it's D, but uh, I think there should be some good discussion. You might find it helpful to draw a diagram on paper and go through the loop, uh, keeping track of how the array changes. Then some movement toward A. That is uh, excellent. That's how this will, will proceed. Uh, let's go through the loop one at a time. Uh, what happens the first time we go around this loop? Yes? Plus you have nums, index 0, which is 2, plus 2 divided by 2, plus 3. Exactly right. This line here says current value at index i plus that value divided by the first element. So that will change our first number to 3. How about the next time around the loop? What's going to happen? Yes. It's going to be nums one, which is 18, plus 18 divided by 3, which is 6. So 18 plus 6 is 24. Exactly. And this is the tricky part about this, is the first time through the loop, we change what's in the first slot of our array. And that actually affects future iterations, future times in our loop. So we'll change this to 24. How about the next one, once i is 2? Um, <clears throat> so we're looking at 5. So uh, nums at 2 is 5 plus 5 over 3. And then since we have integers, 5 over 3 becomes 1. And then we have 5 plus 1, which is 6. Exactly. That's the other, other thing we're, we're reviewing here, is that when we have one integer divided by another, we throw away the decimal part and only keep the integer part. So instead of uh, 1.66666, uh, we end up with just 1. So this becomes... Six, and our last time through, we end up with one plus one divided by three. One divided by three, when we throw away the decimal part, we're just left with zero, so it stays one. Does this make sense? Any part of this would be helpful for me to talk more about? All right, so, now let's move on uh, from just focusing on Java to now something a little more uh, uh, conceptual, and that is object-oriented programming. So we'll zoom way out and talk about what is, what is the motivation for kind of writing our programs uh, based on this idea of objects. And so, yes, Stephen? Well, you are able to break 
like a larger problem into smaller objects and basically it, you're able to handle that detection. Yes, that is an excellent point. This is a sort of problem solving strategy that's often called divide and conquer. But if we can take the larger piece of software or solution that we're trying to implement and break it down into kind of the different pieces, the different objects uh, that perform different roles, uh, that can make the, the problem easier to handle. There's a, a particular situation that, that may help motivate some of this is think about uh, Carlton's registration system. And in the context of an object is data plus functions that do things with that data. So that's, that's, I think, a nice way to think about an object. It's just a way to take, we, we have variables, we have functions that we can call and it might return a value, and if we kind of put those two things together inside a single entity, that's when we get an object, an object that keeps track of some data and then has some functions that interact with that data. But thinking about Carlson's registration system, if it wasn't, something like an object, and let's say it just had the data. That would mean that to interact with the registration system, you would go in and change the data directly. It would be like you would go to the hub and there wouldn't be uh, kind of some uh, form or, or some interface that you go through. It would just be a big spreadsheet of all the registration data, and you would go in and change some part of it. In order to, to register for a class or drive a class, you would go in and directly change whatever uh, uh, files or whatever structures the college was using to keep track of registration. Would there be a, a problem with that? Why, why wouldn't Carlton want to, want to do it that way? Steven? Extremely complicated. So very complicated. There's lots of data, lots of classes, so on and so forth. So that might make it hard to use. Uh, other reasons why we might want might not want to work directly with data, Peter? Yes, there'd be no way to protect or hide parts of data that uh, shouldn't be visible, or, or in particular, that you shouldn't be able to change. Um, so uh, this is this idea of encapsulation. That one role that objects are going to play is that we have some data, but it's going to be inside an object and not sort of exposed to anyone who would want to change it in any way they see fit. And this is very important in the context of this, uh, of the registration system. Shouldn't be able to go in and, and just change whatever you want. So even if we, uh, there was, it was designed so that you only saw your own data and you could change kind of what, uh, what classes you were registered for, just go in and, and change them. Uh, can anyone think of something about, uh, about that that would, that maybe the, the registration wouldn't be able to do if you just go in and directly change what what the classes were? Yeah? Then there would be no restrictions on time, so you could schedule yourself for multiple classes at the same time. Exactly. There's all sorts of things that we want to check when you change your classes, that 
It's at a time you're available, that you're not registered for too many credits, that you meet the prerequisites, that, and when you change what classes you're registered for, it needs to change other data, change what I see on my roster, or how many spots there are available, or all sorts of things. And so that means it's not just maybe changing one point of one piece of data, there's lots of connections. And so this is this other big idea of abstraction that instead of you going in and directly modifying some data, the operation of change the course I'm enrolled in is abstracted into an operate, you kind of interact with the data via this abstraction, via this interface that then underneath is doing all these checks, making sure everything is up to date. And this also means, this abstraction, means that Carlton is free to change how this underlying data is represented, change the computers that it's stored on, change how all these operations are performed, and it can still look exactly the same from all of our perspectives. The web page can look totally unchanged even if everything underneath is working differently. And from a programming perspective, it means that if, if we if we implement this reg registration system and then we want to make changes to it later, make it more efficient, uh, uh, add some extra, some extra checks, add uh, uh, new features, anyone who is using the registration system doesn't have to change everything they're doing. This kind of interface, the, the, the ways that you interact with it can stay the same even as what's underneath changes. Questions on this? These ideas make sense? All right, so this is our kind of high-level motivation for doing object-oriented programming. And so let's dive in and see what defining an object actually looks like in Java and how how the syntax for that works. So, first step. We have the idea of a class. I'm going to be kind of putting some terminology and then showing what the, the corresponding code would look like. So the class is what provides the definition of an object. And this is defining both the data and the behavior, or the data and the functions. Those are both defined as part of the class. So if I was defining a class uh, to be, uh, to represent a rectangle, I might say class, rectangle, open curly brace. Just the class with nothing inside of it, not very useful. So I'm going to want some fields, which are a variable a variable associated with a class or object. And so 
I right, say the rectangle is going to have a field called width, which is going to be a double, going to be a, a decimal number, and it's going to have a double that's a height. And that these, the width and the height would both be fields of the rectangle class. So I said these fields, this is the data part of what's going to be inside our objects. And the behavior part, these are called methods. There are functions associated with an object. And if I wanted to define a method in my rectangle class, I might call the method get uh, area. And this method would return width times height. Is there anything I'm missing from my uh, get area implementation? Gary? Uh, return type. Yes, a return type, and, and what type might this uh, get area return? A double. Exactly. That in Java, I have to put the return type of any of any method. Uh, as part of that method's definition. Questions so far? Everything making sense? All right, so I previously mentioned that there was something called a constructor, which is a special kind of method uh, that is used to create an object. So, special kind of method would be a constructor and this is a method that is called to set up a new object. So my rectangle constructor a constructor is different in a few ways. First it has the same name as the class. And I'm going to have my constructor take in two parameters, a width and a height, that I'll use to set up the data for the new rectangle being constructed. Or I say width equals w, height equals h. So weird things about the constructor. Has the same name as the class. It has no return type. And a constructor is typically used to initialize the fields of the object. 
So in this sense, we want to construct a new rectangle, and we want to give it some width and some height to start out with. And that's the purpose of our constructor. It takes in two numbers, one of which I'll use for the width of the rectangle, one of which I'll use for the height. And so if in code somewhere else I was creating a, a rectangle, I have a, rect a variable rect of type rectangle equals new rectangle of 5 comma 10. So this line here would construct, would create a new rectangle object with a width of 5 and a height of 10, and then store that new object in this variable rect. Um, didn't you already initialize width and height under class, so why would you do it again there? Great question. So what I did here is I declared my fields. I said every rectangle is going to have a width. It'll be a double. Every rectangle is going to have a height, and it'll be a double. So these, this applies to every rectangle object. Everyone has a width and a height. But if I want a specific rectangle object, it needs to have a specific value for the width and a specific value for the height. I might want to have many different rectangles, each with their own width and height. And so the purpose of this constructor is to give this particular rectangle that I'm constructing a particular value for the width and height. Whereas here I'm just saying the width and the height will exist for each rectangle. I'm not saying what value they like, because that, I wouldn't want to define a class of rectangles where the width was always 5. You could only make rectangles with width 5. That's maybe I'd want want different ones. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes. That like general form of the constructor, the constructor that was in the rectangle class, though, right? Yes. This is uh, another method appearing inside the rectangle class. I just didn't have space on the. Board. Does it matter where it goes? Like, should it be at the top? Like, should it be above the fields, below the fields? Uh, so in terms of uh, how what the code does, doesn't matter where it is. Uh, by convention, I mean, I think I have it here. So I have a, a somewhat more complicated rectangle class with some parts that I'll, I'll get to. But by convention, you have the fields first, uh, then the constructor, and then other methods. Is the typical order that you'll you'll find this in. There's a lot going on here that I'm I'm building to, but that's that's the order that stuff goes in. Other questions? Yeah. When I see the private there, should the fields always be private? Yeah. So we're getting to uh, uh, this specification of who should be allowed to access the fields, and that's what's going on with this this private. Uh, so I'll get there. I'll answer that question in, in just a minute. Other questions? All right. Let's see. All right. So uh, two other kinds of methods that will will commonly see. Another kind of method is a mutator or accessor, sorry, not accessor, a mutator or setter method 
which is a method that we use to change the value of a particular field. So we might see a method called set width. which all it does is take in a number and set the field width to that number. It doesn't return anything, which is why I have given the return type void. There's kind of a, a, a complement to our mutator, and that is our accessor or getter method it's a method that retrieves or gets the value of a particular field so we might see one that is called get width and returns the value of the particular field. And so it's very common to see that for each field in an object, for it to have a setter and a getter a method that you can use to change the value of that field and a method you can use to get its current value. Now, why would we need a getter and setter methods? That if we have our I'm writing my rectangle R equals new rectangle of 5 and 10. Would I be able to directly, using the dot notation, say my variable R, which is a rectangle, dot, the name of the field width, equals 7. Could I go in and directly change it? And... This this would only work for fields that have been made public, which is to say that for each field, and in fact each method in a Java class, uh, we can decide, is it the case that anyone should be able to access this field or call this method? Or, should it, or is it encapsulated? Is it hidden inside the class and for internal use only? And so it's typical that we would make our fields, our instance variables, we would make our fields private, meaning that we're not going to let anyone who creates a rectangle just go in and change the width and the height. And that accessing the current value of the width or changing it, that will need to be done through these particular methods. And if we want this like get width method to be ex, uh, to be usable by 
uh, other code, we would need to make it public. Things that we make public, accessible by everyone, things that we make private, only used inside that Java file. And so the kind of rule of thumb fields, usually private, we want to protect uh, the data inside our objects. Methods, usually public, unless it's some uh, helper method, some method that is just being used by another method in the same class. All right, what are your questions on public, private? Is that basic rule of thumb? We want data to be protected, public uh, methods to be used outside the class. Does that make sense? Yes? Uh, is the void set with in the rectangle class that accessible outside? So not unless I said public, which in this case I would want to do. Good, good point. Yes? If you don't say public or private, So if we, you don't say public or private, there are actually two other levels of access that Java supports. In this class, we're only going to think in terms of public and private. But if you don't say either, it's default, which means it can be used by things in the same package, which basically means it can be used by code that's sort of part of the same project, but not code that's outside of that. Um, so, but uh, for, for the labs, uh, for labs one onward, I will expect everything will be either public or private. Um, with the like set with method, is there any point in setting it to public if you don't return it? Uh, you mean if there's no return? Yeah, if there's no return in with w. Uh, so the what set with is is doing is it's changing this private field with. So. In fact, whether it was public or not, we wouldn't have it return anything because there's no, like it takes in a, a, a value and changes width to that. And so we'd want to make it public if we want code out, outside of this class to be able to use set width to change, change the width. Other questions? All right, so what I will want to talk about now is uh, President uh, John Tyler, our 10th president, uh, referred to as his accidency, because if you recall, he became president one month after being elected vice president uh, when William Henry Harrison uh, died. Now, uh, John Tyler, like his nine predecessors, with the exception of John Adams and John Adams' son, John Quincy Adams. Uh, John Tyler was uh, uh, owned slaves, uh, and he also was a kind of outspoken supporter of states' rights and uh, uh, slavery. And a couple of decades later, uh, during the Civil War, joined the, the Confederacy. During his presidency, he uh, vetoed several uh, major legislative priorities of his own party. So he was, uh, no, nobody liked him, um, not his opponents and, and not the, the other members of the Whig party. Uh, he uh, also was uh, a big uh, believer in, in manifest destiny, the idea that the United States should expand across the continent. Uh, and made a big push toward the annex annexation of, of Texas uh, toward the end of his, his term. Here is a uh, uh, map of uh, the uh, area of the modern United States during this time. Uh, see that there was some uh, 
ambiguity of where the border was in the Northwest, um, uh, as well as Texas was was in the process of uh, breaking away from, from Mexico, and there would shortly be uh, uh, wars in that area. Uh, but John Tyler, not very much remembered today, uh, uh, ser served one term, um, very unpopular with uh, his, his uh, political peers. Uh, so uh, this will probably be the only time you hear anything about John Tyler. <laughs> all right, back to data structures. Um, all right, so there's a couple things uh, out today. Uh, there's the first quiz. This is available on Moodle. As I mentioned before, it's untimed. You have unlimited attempts. After you submit the quiz, it will give you immediate feedback on whether your answers were right or wrong. You can attempt it any number of times. My idea is that you use this to kind of practice and work through, make sure you're, you're understanding what we're doing. Uh, the expectation is that you do not uh, consult with other students in the class about the quiz, but it is fine to talk to me about it, to talk to lab assistants about it, to talk to our prefect about it. But I ask that you don't work with other people in the class because this is really an exercise to make sure that you have, uh, are understanding everything that's going on. Also out today, uh, due in one week, is uh, our lab one. This lab can be done in partners. Many of you got emails from me uh, about partner assignments. Uh, and um, let me know if you have uh, any questions uh, about that. I want to talk a little bit about uh, uh, what Lab 1 is, is asking you to do. You're going to be implementing a two-player game. Uh, and in particular, this game is called uh, the Silver Dollar Game. And the idea is there's a strip of paper divided up into sections, and there's uh, some coins, some silver dollars that are at certain positions on this piece of paper. And to take a turn in the game, a player picks a coin and moves it some spaces to the left. The rule is a coin can't jump over another coin. Once a coin is all the way at the end, it can't be moved. And uh, the I believe the winner is the last person uh, to make a move. Uh, and so you are uh, faced with the question of what data structure to use to represent uh, this strip of coins. And the lab write-up talks through a couple possibilities. One possibility is that we have an array of Booleans where we would have something like false, True, false, false, true, false, true, false. Basically to indicate where the coins were. So this is a perfectly reasonable choice, but it does mean that to, to do things like determine what position a coin is at, we have to loop through our array. When we want to move a coin to the left to determine if there's any coins in between where it starts and where the player is trying to move it to, we'd have to loop through the array check spaces in it. And so using this array of Booleans is actually going to make writing the code a little harder and a little more complicated, even though it sort of seems like a natural way we want to represent the state of the game. We just have an array that's the actual board. So what the handout, uh, uh, what the write-up recommends and what I would encourage you to do is to use an array of integers where each spot in the array contains the position of one of the coins. And so for this state, 
I would say the first coin's at position one. Oh my. The next coin is at position zero, one, two, three, four. And the next coin is at position six. And under this sort of representation, if we want to check, can I move the third coin three spaces to the left? I can take this position, subtract three, and compare it. Is it still greater than this position? As a way of checking, can this coin move? Is this moving this coin three spaces, will that move it past this one? So this keeping sort of one position per coin may be a little harder to wrap your head around, but I, I would encourage you to uh, try and go with this because it, it will make the code easier to write overall. Questions on this coin screen? Yeah, Kim. So one coin can't pass another coin? Can they end up in the same slot, though? Uh, no, coins are not allowed to be on top of each other. Okay. Yeah, and so the game is over when all the coins are kind of down, all next to each other um, at, uh, at the left end of the board. So when these positions were 0, 1, and 2, this game would be over because it would mean coin, coin, coin. Other questions? All right. So I want to uh, show you um, a little bit about getting started on the lab. Uh, so there's a uh, handout, like with every lab. Uh, it's a zip file, which we can download, open the zip file, and if I have a new Visual Studio Code window, I can actually drag a folder onto it and it will open that folder. So one of these files is uh, the uh, coin strip class. This is where all your code is going to go. Uh, there's space for name, email, and, and a description of the file up at the top. Uh, if you're working with a partner, include uh, both your names and, and both your emails. Uh, and you may also notice a red squiggle here, and that's because from this lab on, there's going to be automatic checking of the style of your code. And this tool called Check Style is going to automatically tell you when there are problems with the style of your code. In this case, it's one of the things that it's checking is, did you fill in the name, description, and email? And it will show up as a style error if those are left blank. I filled in uh, a fair amount of starter code here, uh, including a, a private instance variable using my uh, suggested approach, though you are allowed to kind of change, uh, change that if you wish. Uh, there's a constructor. There are some required methods uh, that are used by the tests for the lab. Uh, and then uh, you might notice that this here says that this coin strip class implements this other thing, two-player game. So I didn't have time to go, to, go into this uh, in detail today, uh, but what this implements uh, uh, word means is that there are methods defined in this two-player game that CoinStrip must implement. And so the CoinStrip class must have a isValidMove method, it must have a makeMove method, and it must have an isGameOver method. And I filled those in uh, in the starter code. Finally, there's a main method, which I've also filled in with code that's going to run the game and get and ask for, for players' moves. Uh, 
I said at the uh, at the end of today we would know what all the stuff in this uh, uh, main method incantation means in Java. Uh, we know what string bracket means, array of strings. Uh, we know void means it doesn't return anything. We know public means it can be called by code outside of the class. And this last term static means that it is not tied to a specific object. It is associated with the class itself. Which is to say, we do not have to create a coin strip object to be able to call this main method. We can call it uh, independent of any particular coin strip object that exists. This is important for a main method, which we want to be able to run before any coin strip, we need to be able to start this method before any coin strip class, uh, coin strip object has been created. And you'll notice that the first thing this does is create a coin strip object that it will use to play the game. So that's a lot that I've thrown at you. And uh, please read through uh, the write up, bring questions to class. Uh, the other place to bring questions is, you may have noticed on the calendar, there are things called check-in posts. And there's one of those for, for each lab. Uh, and they're deliberately placed sort of halfway between when the lab is released and when the lab is due, so that you have time to get started. And it's a form on Moodle where each of you, and if you're working in a partner with a partner, both of you need to, to make a, one of these posts. We're going to be posting a question uh, or something that you're struggling with, uh, something that you figured out that was very helpful, or respond to someone else's post. It's a way that we can, all, as an entire class, sort of collaborate a bit uh, on the lab. So you don't have to wait until Thursday to post on that form. You can make multiple posts. So that's a great place to, to ask questions. All right. So that's it for the lab. Lab zero is due tonight. There's code on the calendar uh, uh, for doing stuff with uh, shapes and with animation. If you're feeling particularly ambitious, uh, you can uh, use the flying shapes code as a starting point uh, to create something that looks like this. Um, doesn't take uh, all that much code to do. Uh, I have office hours. Uh, 4.30 to 5.30 today uh, and Wednesday morning. There are lab assistants in, in Olin 310. So see you then or see you in class on Wednesday.